having me here. Um, my name is Molly Jacobson. I'm the pollinator ecologist at the SUNY ESF Restoration Science Center. Um, and I'm real happy to be here tonight to talk to you all about the native bees of Martha's Vineyard and the things that you all can do as citizen scientists to help us monitor them and learn more about them. So first, I thought I'd just give a little bit of background on who I am. Um, I, my main interest is in insects, and it has been ever since I was a little kid. Um, but I, um, you know, nowadays most of that revolves around pollinators, but I also am really into bird watching, as, as Matt mentioned. Um, and I've worked with birds for uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and New Jersey Audubon. I'm also interested in native plants, um, especially the interactions between native plants, insects, and birds. And in recent years, I've delved a lot more into uh, native gardening as well. I do a lot of outreach and education in my career, um, including what I'm doing right now. So all sorts of different forms that takes. Um, and I do a lot of photography, as you'll see in this presentation, um, as well as different forms of writing. And really, I just, um, you know, want to do outreach to be able to interest people from all walks of life in the natural world and hopefully get them curious enough to go out there and start looking for the things themselves. Um, so hopefully after this presentation, I will have done that for a few of you at least. Um, I got my Bachelor of Science from the University of New Hampshire, uh, and I did research there on bumblebee declines over 150 years in the state of New Hampshire to assess their conservation status. Um, that picture down below is actually a chance I had to present that research to Governor Chris Sununu at uh, the New Hampshire State House. So that was a really great experience I had there. And I went on to do my master's degree at SUNY ESF, so the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. And that um, my research there looked at how pollinators uh, used wetlands that have been restored for waterfowl and how the management that they do there influences um, the resource availability for different types of pollinators. So I graduated there in spring of 2021, and I'm now working there as their pollinator ecologist. So in this presentation over the next hour or so, um, I'll introduce you to the life history and the ecology of our native bees here in the Northeast. Um, go over a little bit reasons why they're declining um, and what conservation efforts we have going on and what you can do. Then go into how we monitor wild bee populations, how to identify some of our common bees, and then the role that you could play as citizen scientists in helping us learn that information. So here in New England, we have hundreds of species of pollinating insects, everything from the familiar butterflies and hummingbird moths to the more underappreciated flower flies, wasps, and longhorn beetles. But the most indispensable pollinators and the topic of tonight's presentation are none other than bees. So most of us are probably acquainted with these two familiar faces, the honeybee and the bumblebee. In fact, they probably form the basis of most of what society knows about bees in general. But these are not the only bees, not by a long shot. There are 20,000 different species of bees in the world, and over 3,500 here in North America, north of Mexico. Our humble Massachusetts hosts around 380 known species. I also quickly wanted to point out these um, incredible photos here on black background that you'll see a few more of in this presentation. They are from the USGS Native Bee Inventory and Monitoring Lab, um, and they're all in the public domain. So I highly encourage you to go out and check out their Flickr page and see more of these incredible pictures of our wild bees. So I'm sure I don't need to expound about the importance of pollination to our food systems and wild ecosystems to a group such as yourselves. Most of you have probably heard before about how bees make one third of our food supply possible and how even things like coffee or chocolate wouldn't exist without pollinators. But the contributions of native bees in that equation has been grossly overlooked. The pollination value of native bees is estimated at over $3 billion a year in the US. But it's not just about money, it's about results. So research has shown that native bees are better pollinators of some of our most important produce over honeybees. Things like apples, cherries, blueberries, and melons. 
Native bees are more efficient, needing fewer individual bees to get the job done, and they're more effective, yielding more and bigger fruit because of the diversity of ways that bees move around on a flower when looking for pollen and nectar. Some of our crops, like blueberries and tomatoes, need to be buzz pollinated, which honeybees are not capable of doing. So let's look for a moment at some fruits that are important to New Englanders, blueberries, cranberries, and apples. The privilege of having these comes from native bees, our blue orchard bees, mining bees, digger bees, and even this unassuming bee here in black, Melita americana, has no common name, and it's one of many, as we'll learn in this presentation, that we know next to nothing about. It lives in cranberry bogs, and it helps make our classic Thanksgiving dinners possible. We receive these services from native bees for free. We don't bring them to our farm fields, care for them in the winter, and give them everything they need. They are vastly underappreciated, and it's thought that if farms provided more natural habitat for native bees, there'd be enough of them around that, at least for some crops, we wouldn't need to use honeybees at all. So we really should be thinking more about native bees, because in general, it's not a good idea to be reliant on a single species to do such an important job. So let's meet one of my favorite crop pollinators, and I hope this summer you'll all go out and try to look for this one. This is the squash bee, Eucera pruinosa, or you might see it written as Pepinapis pruinosa. So if you have squash or pumpkins in your garden, or if you're a farmer that grows squash, you almost certainly have this bee. They have an uncanny ability to find new patches of squash, which is good because their entire lives revolve around it. These bees nest in the ground near squash plants, and the females seek out squash flowers at dawn, long before honeybees are up and out of the hive. By noon, they're already all done for the day. Males don't have anywhere to live, so they actually sleep inside the squash flower. So open up a flower and you'll likely see one looking out at you, just like this picture that I took. Um, it's thought that these bees actually expanded their range across North America because of the planting of squashes by indigenous tribes, making what was once a pretty uncommon plant available everywhere. But pollination is much bigger than agriculture. We know this. Ecosystems rely on pollination and for more than just flowers. It means the reproduction of plants, plants which are themselves food for countless other species and that produce seeds, nuts, and berries that wildlife depend on. It means brush for animals to hide and nest in, and it means wood and leaf litter where microorganisms cycle our soil. The products of pollination form the physical structure of the natural world and the resources for almost all forms of life. By extension, that includes the ecosystem services like clean air, carbon sequestration, and erosion control that we get from the environment. You'd be pretty hard pressed to find a terrestrial ecosystem on Earth that's not touched by pollination in some way. Even aquatic habitats, apart from the deepest hydrothermal vents, are still at least partially dependent on energy and matter that enters the water from someplace on land. So needless to say, pollinators are worth paying attention to, and they certainly deserve our respect and appreciation. So the life cycle of a bee is one that we all seem familiar with, at least the basics. Bees visit flowers to gather pollen and nectar in the process of pollinating those flowers. Um, and they'll take that back to their nest to feed their young. That's the foundation, but at that point it branches off in many directions, firstly being how they actually collect that pollen. So most bees have a dense brush of branched hairs called a scopa. Most often this is on the back legs, either on the femur or the tibia, and depending on the family or the genus, it might also be under the abdomen or somewhere else on the body. They'll brush all that pollen that gets onto them into the scopa, and that's where it'll stay for the rest of their foraging trip. Some bees don't have any pollen collecting hairs, and they'll appear mostly hairless. They'll eat the pollen, store it in their crop, and then regurgitate it back into their nest as sort of this nice protein slurry. Then we also have the corbiculate bees, which here in the northeastern US, um, those are represented only by the native bumblebees and the non-native honeybee. So instead of a brush of hair, their actual leg is flattened and expanded. 
forming a surface that pollen can stick to after it's been wetted with nectar. That's known as a pollen basket or a corbicula. So seeing a bee with this sticky pollen loaf attached to its back leg is a surefire way to know that you're looking at either a honeybee or a bumblebee. Or if it's empty, you can actually see that wide flat hind leg. So what do bees do once they have all that pollen? You might think they take it back to their hive where she and thousands of other workers use it to feed their young or make honey. Well, not quite. That's the exception rather than the rule. Bees sociality is a wide spectrum and the vast majority of bees, about 75% are right here. They're totally solitary. They make a nest all by themselves. And after going through all the work of gathering pollen for her future offspring, she doesn't even live long enough to meet them. Once she lays her eggs, she seals up the nest and that's the last she ever sees of them. They'll eat the pollen, pupate, and then emerge as adults next year to start the process over again. That really is the life of an average bee. A handful of others are what's called subsocial, where mothers and their offspring do live in the same nest for a little while and share duties. But less than 10% of bees around the world are truly social or use social with hives, workers, and a queen. That includes bumblebees and many sweat bees, but even they don't live in the way that honeybees do. These primitively use social bees have colonies that are small, short-lived, and the hierarchy isn't as rigid. That vision of what we think a bee is, it's called advanced eusociality. And in our part of the world, it's really just honeybees. And again, honeybees aren't native to this continent. So none of our native bees make honeycombs shaped like little hexagons. They're out there by themselves, overlooked by most people, just doing the best they can to ensure the next generation. So now that we know that most bees don't live in hives or make honey, where do they live? Well, the answer is everywhere, right under our noses. And once you start noticing bee nests, you'll realize they're all around you. Over three quarters of our native bees nest in the ground, in burrows that they dig in sandy or loose soil. These can be the most inconspicuous little turrets in a bare patch of ground on your lawn, or they can be nesting aggregations several thousand strong. Good places to see spectacles like that are sandy slopes, hiking paths, or steep riverbanks. But you have to catch them while they're building those nests because once they're done, they won't leave a trace and you'll never know they were there. The rest of our bees nest in cavities. So this can be logs, dead plant stems, even a crack between two bricks. Some even nest in woodpecker holes or snail shells. If you ever see what looks like circular pieces missing from leaves like redbud or Virginia creeper, that's a leafcutter bee gathering leaves to divide up the cells in her nest. And then there are these bees, the cuckoo bees. They don't make a nest at all. They are kleptoparasites, which personally, I think these are some of the coolest bees. Instead of going out and gathering pollen for weeks on end, which is a lot of hard work, they find another bee's nest, sneak in or fight their way in, and lay their eggs in that nest instead. Their larva eats all the pollen meant for the host larva. And this strategy is so successful, it's evolved multiple times across almost all bee families. And there's more species of cuckoo bees in the world than there are social bees. If you can believe it, there's even parasitic bumblebees that usurp other colonies and brainwash the workers using pheromones. It's a wild world out there, and that's why bees spend so much of their time guarding their nest. Because just inches away, there could be a cuckoo waiting for the right moment to make its move. I actually took this bottom picture in my backyard. So these really cool interactions are happening all around us all the time. It might seem rough, but it's good to have cuckoo bees around. They tend to be host specific, only going after a certain kind of bee. So if there's cuckoo bees, it means there's healthy, diverse populations of other bees. So if you've never seen a bee tongue before, this is what it looks like. All of those separate parts come together to help suction nectar into a bee's mouth. It's the length of that tongue, along with the size of the bee, 
that plays a huge role in determining what flowers the bee is able to forage from. Bee tongues range from short, stubby little things to egregiously long, and they've evolved to best reach into certain flowers, like that orchid bee on the right. A lot of bees have short to moderate tongue lengths, and that works just fine for them because there are a lot of flowers that they can access. Those kinds of bees would be very happy in a field like this, full of composites in the aster family, like goldenrod, bone set, cone flowers, and fleabane. Those flowers don't hide their nectar in a deep corolla, it's right at the surface. And these kinds of short, shallow flowers are popular with a lot of other insects too, like pollinating wasps and flies, because they also tend to have really short tongues. But what about these flowers that tuck their rewards far away? Some of them aren't just deep, they're tricky. They require manipulation. Not a lot of bees are up to the task. You need bees with big, strong bodies and long tongues, like bumblebees and leafcutter bees. They get exclusive access to these resources, and they can still visit those shallow flowers too if they want, but why go to the crowded buffet table when you have a private three-course dinner all to yourself? Overall, the average length of a bee tongue gets the job done, but that diversity makes it possible for bees to get in and pollinate all the unique shapes of our wildflowers. However, this only dictates what flowers a bee can visit. What they will visit is sometimes a different story. So here we see a common site in August, a field of sunflowers, and those sunflowers are covered by loads of bees. These two here are our friends, the common Eastern bumblebee, Bombus impatiens. And this is a bee that's in everyone's gardens because it loves all kinds of flowers. She's enjoying her sunflower. And after this, she might go off and visit, let's say a patch of purple cone flower. Then maybe some bee balm and then some milkweed. She is a generalist as most of our bees are and has the capability and one could say the willingness to visit a wide variety of flowers from different plant families with different colors and flower shapes. She can learn to manipulate those different structures to get at the nectar and pollen. Now, as we recall, bumblebees are social bees that need to provide not just for themselves, but hundreds of other workers, offspring, and their queen. So it's essential they can be flexible in where they get their food because from early spring, through late fall, they have a colony to look after. Almost all social bees are generalists, but certainly generalists don't need to be social. Most bees, either social or solitary, are generalists. Now, right on the sunflower next to our bumblebees is another bee, Melisodes trinotis. They can be fairly common if you catch them at the right time. She's probably spent most of her day on these sunflowers because she is a specialist. More specifically, she is oligolectic, meaning she collects pollen for her young from one family of plants. In this case, she prefers a handful of genera in the aster family, and sunflowers are her food of choice. Sorry, sorry. So after this, she might check out the black eyed Susans and then maybe pop over to the goldenrod. But really, that's her main rotation. In New England, around 15% of our bees are specialists. And that number goes up a lot as you move into places like deserts. Specialists lead somewhat different lives than generalists. They co-evolved with their host plants, so they only emerge for a short time each year when their host is flowering. And during that short window, they gather pollen from that flower and they do it very efficiently because they learn to manipulate that one flower shape better than anyone else. Depending on the host, some specialists are common while others are very rare. If you're lucky enough to find a patch of our native perennial sunflowers, you might just stumble upon this bee here, Andrina helianthi, which as its name suggests, is a big fan of helianthus, the genus of sunflowers. This is another specialist, but it's a lot rarer than our Melisodes. It is monolectic, and monolectic specialists only visit flowers from a single genus or sometimes a single species of plant. Let's talk about putting all your eggs in one basket. 
Well, our bee is so particular that she only wants perennial sunflowers and rarely visits the annuals that we have in our garden or on our farms. Because it's the only thing her larvae eat, there needs to be a lot of it to support a population of these bees. If that meadow is bulldozed for a housing complex and the sunflowers disappear, so will the bee. And that's the risk of being a specialist. Bees that are highly specialized often have adaptations that make it easier for them to gather pollen from their host. So let's take a look again at this bee from earlier in the presentation. She is a blueberry cellophane bee, Calides validus, and you're only going to find her in clearings with lots of blueberries. Look at the shape of these blueberry flowers. Not just any bee can get their heads inside deep enough to reach the pollen and nectar, but evolution has shaped this bee perfectly. She doesn't have a very long tongue, but she makes up for it by having one of the longest faces of any bee in her family. And that makes her, that allows her to access these resources. So specialists might not make up a big proportion of our bees, but they have unique and indispensable roles to play. The squash bees, the blueberry and cranberry specialists, many of these inconspicuous bees play a larger role than we ever realized in crop pollination. And they also ensure the continued existence of so many wildflowers on our landscape. Generalists do most of the pollinating in ecosystems, but both are needed because of their different strengths and skill sets to make sure that no matter what happens, there's always someone to pollinate each kind of flower. That redundancy with many species playing similar but not identical roles knits a tightly interwoven web that's stable in the face of disaster, either natural or man-made, and can bounce back from every challenge that's thrown at it. Out of anything to understand about native pollinators, it's the millions of years of connections and relationships to the land around them that make them special and important. And in my opinion, it makes them fascinating to observe and study. So we understand the roles that different bees play in the natural worlds and for our food supply, but those crucial services are in jeopardy. The last several decades haven't been kind to pollinators, and right now we're at a critical junction to study our native bees and to put that information to good use to protect them and their habitat. A question I get a lot is, are all bees dying out? Well, the good news is no. Uh, a lot of bees, possibly even most, are doing okay, so far as we can tell, which I'll get back to that in a little bit. But from what information we have, a big portion of our bees are carrying on just as they always have. And a few of them have actually increased from just a century ago because they're so good at surviving in our backyards and our cities. But some bees are absolutely in decline and at least one is already extinct in North America with a handful of others approaching that brink quickly. Several species of bumblebees have declined a startling amount in just a few decades. And who else is at risk? The specialists with their very limited diets and the cuckoo bees, the parasites that rely on other bees. A lot of those were rare to begin with. And some of them, like parasites on declining bees, we haven't seen them in years or even decades. If we start losing bee diversity, we're going to see those consequences in our food supply, needing to rely even more on honeybees, which have themselves been experiencing declines. Ecosystems are going to suffer, becoming more unstable, less diverse, and more vulnerable to future disaster. The primary reason for bee declines is the oldest one in the book. We've converted diverse natural habitat into a whole lot of this. This is where over 80% of the US population lives. Well, have fun trying to find a patch of sunflowers for our specialists in that. But I'll tell you, if it was just urban sprawl, most of our bees would probably still be doing okay. Well, welcome to Anywhere USA. This picture is from California, but you probably wouldn't know it because the scene is the same across much of the continent. About one half of the land area in the, in the, uh, in the US is in agriculture, and most of it looks like this. If I zoom out, wow, these are not the prairies the wide open plains where the bison once roamed. This is Roundup Ready corn and soybean, a Mad Max Thunderdome for pollinators. 
It's not rocket science to figure out that the landscape can no longer physically support as many pollinators or wildlife when that much habitat has for all intents and purposes been removed from the picture. Agriculture doesn't just remove habitat, it introduces other forms of harm for those few rugged bees trying to cling on in these inhospitable places. You might have heard before about neonicotinoid pesticides, the most commonly used class of insecticides in the US today. And we now know the devastating impacts that certain ones like Amidacloprid and Clotharanidin have on bees and other wildlife like songbirds. If they don't kill bees outright, they can cause a weakening of the immune system, neuro neurological impairments and reduced breeding success. It travels in the air, the ground, the water, and up through plants themselves to be secreted through nectar and pollen. Bumblebees living in agricultural areas also come into contact with pathogens when they meet their captive reared kin, the honeybees and bumblebees that we produce in greenhouses to pollinate our crops. And that's led to major widespread infections among wild bumblebees. The result is yet again, a weakened immune system making it harder for them to fight off the effects of pesticides and vice versa. But surely there's still plenty of habitat left. We have our city parks, our nature preserves, our own gardens. Especially up here in New England, it seems like we're surrounded by forests. Even if we build into it and crisscross it with roads just a little bit more each year. But it's not just about habitat quantity, it's the quality too. There are 40 million acres of turf grass lawn in the US, and that's 40 million acres that bees can't use. Those little green flecks, what kind of biodiversity are they supporting? And how much of it is native? Could a bee from one fly all the way to the other, or is it effectively trapped? Habitat in urban, suburban, and agricultural areas are too often just little green islands in a sea of human development. Degraded habitat might not be developed into a parking lot, but functionally it's crippled and not able to support a diversity of plants and animals. Habitat can be degraded in a lot of ways. One of them is through invasion by exotic species like this one here, porcelain berry, which yes, the, we do have this on the vineyard. This is no longer functional pollinator habitat. It's not habitat for much of anything anymore. Urban and suburban green spaces tend to suffer the most from this because of how close they are to human development. More invasive species coming in through trade ports, greater isolation on all sides, more runoff, light pollution, sound pollution, and urban predators. Just because the habitat is technically still there doesn't mean it's living up to its potential. On top of all of this, there are other less visible impacts of the changes that humans have made to the landscape. Research has shown that honeybees can outcompete native bees for resources, leading them to forage on less desirable or nutritional flowers. They can also potentially pass some diseases on to bumblebees. And lastly, climate change is already resulting in range shifts for some bumblebees, pushing them up to higher elevations where it's cooler, but effectively trapping them with no escape as temperatures continue to rise. At the same time, we're starting to see shifts in when flowers bloom in the spring. But the emergence of bees, particularly their specialists, might not shift at the same rate. That could lead to a dangerous mismatch between a plant and its pollinator. And of course, with extreme weather events becoming more common, there's the potential for the destruction of habitat in ecologically sensitive areas. So all these things I mentioned, they interact together. Just one of those wouldn't push a bee to the brink of extinction, but when it's fighting threats on all fronts, sometimes it's just too much. Poor nutrition, weakened immune systems, high stress environments, and small isolated populations. That's what bees are facing in today's world. Scientists believe that if bees just had enough habitat, quality habitat, they'd be able to weather most of these other challenges. So how do we help our native bees thrive and continue to perform those essential roles for generations to come? Well, we need to define what bees need and then how we can provide that for them. These are very simple things, things that we all need. Bees need sources of food, places to nest and raise young, and safe refuge from threats. So we've learned about the kinds of floral resources that different bees use. 
When we translate that to the level of an ecosystem of supporting many species, we need a diversity of native flowering plants for both generalists and specialists. So your everyday purple cone flowers that bring in bumblebees, honeybees, and sweatbees, those are great, but don't overlook those dainty violets or the weedy ground cherries. They're food for specialists, and they can provide important resources when those big ticket items aren't in bloom. And that's the second important point. To support lots of pollinators, or even just a few colonies of social bees, you need to offer resources for the entire growing season, early spring through mid-fall. There are bees that emerge when there's still snow on the ground in March, and there's bees flying on the vineyard in mid-November. I saw them. So in healthy ecosystems, they, this will be provided by a variety of flowers that come and go every few weeks, with a handful that bloom for longer periods. There needs to be a network of different habitats connected across the landscape, each one providing one piece of that seasonal puzzle. Many bees will move between habitats to get the resources they need, and having them connected with safe corridors makes that possible. The next thing that bees need is a place to nest. We learned that most bees prefer to nest in the ground. In natural habitats, there's usually some bare ground open, like on the forest floor or in sandy clearings. Stem nesting bees should have no shortage of woody debris and dead stems to nest in. Lastly, bees need refuge. Ideally, this is the same place as where they nest and forage. But sometimes in cities or on farms, they have to forage in dangerous places like near busy streets or in pesticide sprayed fields. And they also need some place to overwinter, especially bumblebee queens that overwinter in the leaf litter. So bees need some place to return to where they're not being threatened by predators, pollutants, or harsh weather. So how can we help provide what bees need? The best and most rewarding place to start is of course in your own backyard. If you want to benefit our native pollinators, as well as songbirds, other wildlife, and the functioning of the environment as a whole, consider landscaping or gardening with plants that are native to our region, northern New England, or even better, plants native to the vineyard. Besides being important to bees, they host the caterpillars of butterfly and moth pollinators, which in turn are the main food source for songbirds and their chicks. You could consider reducing the size of your lawn if there's parts you don't use. Lawn is poor habitat for native species and good habitat for invasive species. And plus it needs a lot of work to maintain in the conditions we have here in New England, which means more fertilizers and pesticides. Reducing lawn area could mean anything from starting an herb garden to converting your front yard into a pollinator meadow. The possibilities are limited only by your imagination and the commitment that you're comfortable making. Try to follow those principles of what bees need, choosing flowering plants that bloom at different times of year. You can also offer nesting sites just by keeping a patch of your yard as bare dirt, even if it's just the margin. And don't remove things like logs and dead stems. You can aim to reduce or eliminate pesticide use in your yard, and that includes things like mosquito spraying. There are smarter ways to deal with those problems that, at their source that don't have the same kind of negative impacts on the health of the ecosystem around you. The last thing you can do is get others interested. You can work towards connectivity, a network of native pollinator-friendly yards where bees can safely travel and find all the food and shelter they need to thrive. But you're probably wondering, what do I do if I don't have a yard? For example, if you rent or if you just don't have any yard, uh, land with your house. Well, I'd recommend you get involved with a community garden. So it's your own little space, usually for pretty cheap, where you can grow herbs, vegetables, and flowers that pollinators will love. Bees love community gardens and so do birds. They can be a pretty cool place to see wildlife. And you can also support small independent farms like those here on the vineyard that are committed to sustainable pollinator friendly practices. Small land clearings in a primarily forested area like New England can actually increase biodiversity if managed responsibly by providing unique resources and diversifying the landscape. Right, so that was a lot of information and we can take a quick breather here. That is pretty much the first half of this presentation. 
Um, at the end, I'll put up some resources that'll help you learn more about choosing the right native plants for your yard and where you can get them locally. So I wanted to go back to something I said several slides ago about how not all bees are declining so far as we know. Well, therein lies one of our big problems. There is a lot that we don't know. A surprising amount given how many people are studying bees and how much attention that they've been getting. But a lot of bees are rare or secretive. And because of this, we don't even know basic things about where some bees live, uh, what their range is, what flowers they visit, and if they're really doing all right, or if they are declining and we just don't know it yet. All of those missing answers makes it hard for us to know what they need to thrive and how to best go about protecting them. So we're in desperate need of long-term data over large areas and decades of time. The way that researchers gather these data is through standardized monitoring all over the country and the world. The longer we do this, the more complete a picture we get about what bees live where and if they're at risk. Bee researchers tend to use the same sets of methods so we can compare our findings. The first method that we use is called pan traps, or more specifically, bee bowls. As you can see in this picture, they're pretty much just plastic cups. They're painted fluorescent blue, yellow, and white, and, and that mimics flowers and attracts bees. Those cups are filled with soapy water, and bees will fall in and meet a swift demise. There's all sorts of setups for these. Uh, most of the time, they're placed right on the ground in a straight line. They can be left out for a day, a week, or even months, and then you can come and retrieve the specimens. That photo on the right is actually a trap for an emerald ash borer, which is an invasive beetle that we have. So uh, yellow pan traps are actually used um, in catching a lot of different kinds of insects. This method is great because it catches a lot of bees and it takes very little effort to do. Plus it can cover a large area over a long time without people needing to actually be there. The downside is that it tends to catch certain kinds of bees over others. So for that reason, we usually pair bee bowls with a second method called sweep netting, which as you can see, I've done quite a lot of. Um, and really it's just one step up from swinging a butterfly a net around as you did with a, as a kid, you know? It, sweep netting, it can capture the bees that don't come to the bee bowls like bumblebees. And it also gives us one very important piece of information. When we catch a bee off of a flower, we now have a unique plant pollinator interaction on record. That helps us learn the resources that that species needs. The downsides to this are that it's more time intensive and researchers and volunteers need to be trained on the proper methods. Plus, you know, if you're not keen on sticking your hand into a net full of angry bees, that might also be a downside to each their own. There are methods, uh, other methods that researchers use, like blue vein traps or trap nesting, um, and that's where you put out stems for bees to nest in, and then you collect the stems. But by far, these are the standard ways that we monitor wild bees. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering why we'd want to kill bees when we're trying to save them, and you wouldn't be alone in that question. There are certainly some alternatives to lethal collection. You could set up cameras near flowers and record pollinator visits. You could do mark recapture studies where you paint individual bees so you can monitor a population. And you could even catch and identify bees in the fields and then let them go once you've recorded them. Those methods might work in very specific circumstances on a small scale. But when you're looking to monitor scale bees on the scale that we need to get that information to protect them and their habitat, well, we need a lot of data and it can't take forever to get. We have limited manpower and resources at our disposal, as I think anyone in a natural science field can attest. Bee researchers care a lot about making our practices as ethical as possible. Studies have shown that when doing lethal sampling, only a tiny percentage of all the bees in a population are actually being collected and there's never been any demonstrated negative impact on that population. Bees really do need to be collected because most of them can't be identified to species in the fields or even through a photograph. We need to look at them under the microscope. And usually that's not possible when the bee is alive and kicking. 
when specimens are saved, they can be of use for decades or centuries to come for future research and education. It's also a physical record that can be checked to make sure we identified it correctly. And DNA can be taken from the bees to improve the way we identify them in the future. Lastly, lethal collection methods are more efficient. They allow us to document more species and often rare ones that you're probably not going to just come across if you go out into the field once or twice. So really that's why we use these methods because the benefits to bees as a whole has far exceeded the loss of a few bees on the small scale. Now you don't have to be a professional scientist to help us monitor bees and you don't have to kill any bees either if you don't want to, obviously. Um, we really could use all the help that we can get in any way, shape or form. We're lucky if we get to survey a handful of sites in one region per year. We need more pairs of eyes on the ground, covering the area that we can't and finding bees that we're missing because nobody knows your home like you do. We are very lucky now that so many people have become interested in native pollinators and that technology is continually improving. And that allows more people to have access to cameras that take high resolution images. This is making it possible for citizen scientists to make meaningful contributions to the study and conservation of native bees. And the best part is that you get to engage on your own terms, only doing what's exciting and interesting to you. So I wanted to highlight some of the amazing things that any one of you could find. Like I said, we know very little about a lot of bees. And part of that is because there's some habitats we don't survey very much, like wetlands. There are a lot of unique bees in wetlands. At the same time, many of our native bees have few, if any, living photos. That's pretty incredible to think about that so few people have seen these in the wild that there is not even any pictures of them on the World Wide Web. These two here are a great example. These are two rare wetland bees. The one on the left, Macropus nuda, visits native loosestrifes, not the invasive purple loosestrifes, and gathers their plant oils. The other bee, Andrina parnassi, only visits a little flower called fen grass of Parnassus, found in fens. These are, in fact, some of the only photos that exist of these two bees. And here's two more, a specialist on bee balm, Duphoria monardi, and a specialist on laurel, Andrina calmier, both of them considered pretty rare. But are they really rare or is no one looking for them in the right place or at the right time? And if they really are rare and people are looking, then why are they rare? Why would a bee balm specialist be rare when tons of people plant bee balm in their gardens? or a laurel specialist rare when sheep laurel and mountain laurel are common in our New England forests? Is there some other aspect to the habitat that we're overlooking? Some other thing that the bees need that we don't know about? We don't have that information because we just don't find them often enough. So who's going to go out and check the woods behind their house in late spring when the laurel is in full bloom? And who will plant three or four different kinds of bee balm to see if a specialist might prefer one over the other? And then there are the real rarities, the ones that actually have no living photos. I chose this one as a good example because it has a fascinating story to tell. This little bee with no common name is a specialist on American chestnut, which as we know has disappeared from our landscape, supposedly taking this bee with it. For nearly a century, we presumed it might be extinct. And then just within the last decade, it was found again on chinkapin trees, which are closely related to chestnuts. It's been surviving this whole time undetected after its main host was wiped out. Still, it's extremely rare, unless maybe we start searching for it again. Now that chestnuts are being grown in orchards and might return to the landscape, maybe this bee will make a comeback. And someone out there, like you, could get the very first photo of our native chestnut bee. So switching gears just a little bit, let's talk about islands. Specifically, the islands we have here in the northern temperate region of North America. Islands are refuges from human disturbance. If we take good care of them, or if we decide not to live on them, they can be critical refuges for species that have become rare on the mainland or even extirpated entirely. 
Islands and coastal areas have unique and rare habitat types like dunes, salt marshes, pitch pine barrens, and sand plain grasslands that host rare species and give islands their unique character. Islands can also have isolated populations of species that don't normally occur in other parts of this region. Southeastern Massachusetts, for instance, has a lot of plants and insects that are normally found south or west of here. That's partly because our coastal climate is a little milder than inland, keeping summers cooler and winters a little warmer. It also has to do with the movement of glaciers during the last ice age. Species moved north following the receding of the ice sheet and crossed a land bridge over to these islands, then got trapped here when that land bridge disappeared. That left islands with some pretty unique natural communities that you won't find on the mainland. Martha's Vineyard is pretty special in this respect. The vineyard is known for having the highest concentration of regionally threatened invertebrates in all of New England, as well as a high concentration of rare plants too. A survey of native bees done on the island several years ago found 182 different species of bees. And that is almost half of all the bees known from Massachusetts on just this one island. Two species had never even been found in Massachusetts before. The glacial outwash in the center of the island and the coastal moraine on the perimeter of the island offers this coarse sandy substrate that a lot of bees really like to nest in, including many rare sand specialists. So why is it important to monitor bees on the vineyard? Well, firstly, there might be species here we've never documented, ones that are rare or declining on the mainland, but hanging on all right here. There might also be species that are disappearing from the island, but we won't know it if we don't search for them in standardized ways. This is a limited area, but so much remains unknown, and that means every person has the potential to make an interesting discovery. Thirdly, there are new species arriving all the time, either naturally or through human intervention. And it's important to track those introductions to learn more about how species disperse, but also to make sure those species aren't invasive and having negative impacts on the island. If they are, that data will help us develop strategies to limit their spread. Now, when it comes to monitoring bees, most of the time that's involved doesn't come from collecting, but from identifying. As I mentioned earlier, we have to capture most bees and take them back to the lab to tell what they are. And that process can take months on end because identifying bees is pretty tough work. This right here is what you might call an average bee under the microscope. When we identify bees, we're looking at dozens of minute features like details of the wing venation or the punctures on different parts of the body, different parts of the face like the mandibles, or the ratios of different parts of the tongue, and so many more that separate these species on a microscopic level. It's taxing work for experts to do this, but I'll tell you it is worth it because of the data that we get from it, but also because of how incredible and beautiful that bees are under the microscope. The level of intricate micro sculpturing of bees and all insects is astonishing, and each species is unique. Now, this might all make it seem like bee identification is out of reach for a non-scientist, but I am happy to tell you that that is not at all the case. There are a lot of bees that you can identify at least to genus, maybe even species, from a photo or in the field. And that includes most of the ones you're probably seeing in your garden. So if you want to learn to identify bees in the field or from a photo, there's some features that you should pay attention to that'll help you narrow down what it might be. A few of them are intuitive. How big is the bee? What are its general color patterns and how fuzzy is it? But beyond this, there are other things to look at that might make all the difference. Firstly, are there markings on the face? A lot of male bees have yellow or white on this plate called the clypeus. Some bees have bold stripes near the eyes. If you can get a good look, Note if the bee's body is metallic. Now this next one could be really important for a beginning observer to learn. A lot of bees are striped on their abdomen, but are those stripes bands of hair or are they the actual color of its body? The placement of those stripes could also be important too. 
As we've already mentioned, bees hold their pollen on different parts of their body. So if that stands out, that could be helpful too. And then there's other things like when you see them and where. There's several groups of bees that are only out in the spring or only in late summer. Note what flower it's on. And if it's not on a flower, what it's doing. If it, is it digging a nest or did it just disappear into a hole in a stem? Now learning to identify bees, that is a webinar in and of itself. Um, and there are 31 different genera in six families known from the vineyard. So I really only have time to go over a handful here. But I hope this can be a starting point for you to learn the general impressions of what our common bees look like. So you can start recognizing them the next time you see them. The first bee to know is our bumblebees in the genus Bombus, which is a great name, in the family Apidae, which also includes honeybees. We have over a dozen kind of bumblebee here in Massachusetts and several that are known from the vineyard. They're generally large in size with stout fuzzy bodies and they have that characteristic pollen basket. There's some combination of yellow and black, occasionally with a patch of brown or red. Now, this is by no means unique. We have a lot of yellow and black bees, but none of them have those pollen baskets. And unlike some other lookalikes, a bumblebee will never have colored markings on its body. Their bodies are all black, despite what color their hair might be. That one on the bottom left there is our common Eastern bumblebee, which you saw earlier. And by far, that's the one that you will see in your gardens the most often. Bumblebees are one of the few genera of bees where most of them can be identified from a photo. And that's one reason why they're good for citizen science. So I want you to burn these images into your brain because you want to be on the lookout for these two species. The one on the left is the golden northern bumblebee, Bombus fervidus, and it is here on the island. It's declining in New England and we would really like to keep track of it. The one on the right is the yellow banded bumblebee, Bombus terricola. It used to be here on the island, but we haven't seen it in a very long time. And again, it's declining pretty severely. So we'd like to keep track of that as well. There are no other bees on the vineyard that look like these two. So if you see either of them, please take a picture and report it to one of the websites I'll talk about at the end of the presentation. Here's another bee that most people are probably familiar with and that you might mistake for a bumblebee. This is our Eastern carpenter bee, Xylocopa virginica, so-called because it nests in soft and decaying wood. They're really large, usually bigger than a bumblebee. And what's important is that they have a shiny hairless abdomen. Bumblebees are fuzzy all over. They also don't have that pollen basket either. Males, which are the ones that people usually see hovering around them, they're really easy to spot because they have a white face and big green eyes. Here's just a few other pretty common members of that family, Apidae. Our long-horned bees, genus Melisodes, uh, are named because the males have really long antennae, almost as long as their whole body. You'll see those on composites like sunflowers in late summer. Our small carpenter bees in the genus Serotina look nothing like the big carpenter bees, and they really are a lot smaller. They're metallic blue with white markings on their face, and they nest in stems like sumac or blackberry. And then there's the nomad bees, genus Nomada, which you also saw earlier. These are cuckoo bees. So they're hairless and usually brick red with yellow markings. You can see them in the springtime, hovering low to the ground, looking for the nests of other bees. Now the sweat bee family is a big one and it's really diverse. So I've kind of grouped them all together here because a lot of them look the same. This is by the numbers, an average bee. Most of them are, or many of them are black with white bands of hair on the abdomen and others are metallic, either gold, olive or bright green. All of our green bees in this part of the country are in this family. So if you see a bright green bee, you'll immediately know what it is. Despite how colorful these guys are, they're hugely overlooked because a lot of them are really small, but they, you can find them on practically any flower because they are generalists. 
Now, this is a group that most people probably don't know, but you definitely should because they're really interesting and you probably have them nesting in your yard. These are the mining bees, the genus Andrina in the family Andrinidae. I've actually shown a lot of them in the presentation already because they tend to be specialists. So they're generally out in either spring or late summer and fall. You can see them in the woods, pollinating many of our spring ephemerals. They're really diverse in appearance, but they are united by one important feature, the facial fovea, which are depressions on the face filled with dense hair. You can see in the inset photo there, they look like basically vertical lines running down the face. To the naked eye, um, you can usually see these um, or in a picture as well. I've heard it described as vertical eyebrows, which I think is the funniest thing. So if that helps you remember it, that's great, go for it. This next family of bees is also really easy to recognize, possibly the easiest. Um, this is the Megachylidae. It includes our leaf cutter bees, our mason bees, and our resin bees. You also probably have these nesting in your yard, in your yard somewhere. Um, they nest in cavities, including cracks in buildings, old fences, bee hotels that you might put up, anything they can find, really. What unites all of these is that they store their pollen not on their legs, but beneath their abdomen. As you can see in this picture, that left-hand bee, um, it looks like they've got a yellow or a white shag carpet on their bellies. And that's usually pretty visible to the naked eye. They're also built really stocky, like little tanks. The two common genera are the leafcutter bees, genus Megachylae, which are large and black and white, and the mason bees, the genus Osmia, which are metallic blue and they're out in springtime, especially in apple orchards. If you can tell that your bee is in this family here, it's pretty easy to narrow it down after that. The last really distinctive and common group here are the masked bees, the genus Hylaeus in the family Calididae. These are easy to mistake for wasps. They're tiny and hairless and they're black with yellow markings. Females have two light colored triangles on their faces, while males have a yellow mask. Again, once you start paying attention, you'll realize these tiny little guys are all over the place. Lastly, I thought I'd throw in just a few non-native bees that are really common. Firstly, our honeybee in the top left, it's got those pollen baskets and it has an abdomen that's usually either orange and black or tan and black. On your right is the European wool carter bee, um, which can be really common in gardens if you plant things in the mint family, like especially things like catnip, cat mint. Um, these are big bees. The males are really territorial. They'll hover around you. Um, and the females gather plant wool to line their nests with. Lastly, the horn-faced bee is a type of mason bee. And if you have a bee hotel set up in your yard, you will probably see these. They are the main occupants that comes to use those bee hotels. So I hope this helped you get started on recognizing some of our wild bees. I know this is just a very brief introduction. Um, so if you want to learn more about how to identify bees, again, I'll have some resources at the end of the presentation. So the question that finally relates back to the title of this presentation, where do you find bees? The answer to that is another question. What's blooming, when, and where? Bees are dictated by millions of years of evolution that define their diet, how they nest, and when they emerge. We can predict where bees will be based on the resources available to them and the patterns of a dynamic landscape. In the springtime, a lot of bees will be in the woods where the first action is. All those dainty little wildflowers on the forest floor, like trout lilies, trilliums, and water leaf, those are prime resources for bumblebee queens, first emerging from hibernation and for specialist bees. At the wood's edge, in clearings and wet thickets, you have willows, blueberries, cherry trees, and apple trees, all covered with bees. In summer, the meadows and the roadsides come alive when the forests quiet down. And this is also when a lot of non-native flowers like clover, Queen Anne's lace, and sweet pea um, are attracting bees in urban and suburban areas. So we've got a lot of things like our native milkweeds, cone flowers, bee balm, elderberry, so many more that all are flowering in primarily open areas. And then in late summer and autumn, 
the fields undergo that wonderful transformation into a sea of asters and goldenrods. That hosts a whole new set of bees and their critical support for generalists like bumblebees. Wetlands are also reaching their peak with pickerel weed, smart weeds, and joe pie weed, and so many others that are drawing in pollinators and supporting future bumblebee queens trying to fatten up before winter. The other option is a simple one. You could go out and search for bees, or you can let them come to you. Plant native flowers, shrubs, trees, and grasses, and then just spend some time in your yard. You will be surprised at how many species of pollinators are on your property if you have just a few native plants, and that number will only grow as you add more. So if after all of this, you find yourself wanting to go out and look for some bees, we hope that you would extend that enthusiasm into becoming a citizen scientist. That means on its most basic level, helping to collect data for scientists that can be used in research for monitoring populations and even helping develop management strategies. There are so many ways to get involved and to contribute data. Firstly, you could use a citizen science website or app like iNaturalist, Bumblebee Watch or Bug Guide. These have no commitment. Whenever you see something cool and take a picture, you can upload it at your leisure. There's no minimum required effort, just a cool way to keep track of what you've seen for yourself and for science. You could also sign up for a specific project, um, and there's hundreds of these across the country. For, for instance, Beecology is a project from Worcester Polytech in UMass Dartmouth right here in Massachusetts. These projects have specific protocols that you can follow to collect standardized data. Then lastly, you could volunteer for a coordinated monitoring effort like BioBlitzes or state pollinator surveys. Nonprofits like Audubon or Biodiversity Works rely on volunteers for all kinds of important surveys. Some of these that get a lot of people together might have been stunted by COVID, but most of them are done on your own. So volunteering to survey a small area near where you live could be really helpful for us, especially if you live in some place rural, because those places are really underrepresented in our data. You can choose what kind of citizen science works best for you based on your interest level and what time and energy you want to commit. All of them are valuable. So you'll see that iNaturalist is bolded here, and I just want to quickly talk just a little bit more about that. Here on the vineyard, iNaturalist is a really valuable tool if you want to contribute a pollinator sighting or a sighting of anything. The Martha's Vineyard Atlas of Life, if you're not already familiar with it, is a project from Biodiversity Works hosted on iNaturalist, and it's trying to catalog all the species on the island. You can see here that Matt is number one on everything. You can, you can oust him from that spot. So if you get an account, you can add a photo sighting of anything to the project, and that's more data to help us learn about the vineyard. So Matt will be able to tell you more about um, any specific upcoming projects and the best ways to get involved with um, the Atlas of Life and those other projects. Whew. All right, so that's basically it. Um, with these last few slides, I just want to give you some of these resources that you can uh, learn more about our native bees and how to garden for pollinators. Um, so I've got six books here. Um, these are all ones that I swear by. Um, there are obviously many more than this, but these are some of my favorites. They are excellent for all levels of knowledge. Um, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy has a special place in my heart. Um, it was probably the first book on this topic that I read many, many years ago, um, and it has changed, well, it's, it's changed my life really. So I, I highly recommend that one if you don't already know it. Here's the other three books as well. Um, this one here on, on the right uh, just came out in 2021. Um, it's a great resource if you're trying to plan a garden in a place with high deer pressure, which I know is you know, pretty common in New England. Um, and so, here I have some websites. Um, these are for native plants um, to learn more about native plants. Um, so the Xerxes Society, uh, I definitely want to mention it's probably the best resource in the country.
for information on pollinator habitat. It has a lot of management guides and technical guides for landowners, for farmers, for businesses, for towns. Um, it's, it's, it's really great. Um, Grow Native Massachusetts is a site that everyone in Massachusetts should know about. It is exceptional with all sorts of information specific to different regions, including the islands. And importantly, it has a full list of all native nurseries in the entire state. So where you can buy those native plants. Here on the island, Poly Hill Arboretum is going to be your source for native plants, but there are many others in southeastern Massachusetts as well. Prairie Moon Nursery um, and Wild Ones, a another uh, great resources um, to learn more about native plants. Um, and Prairie Moon as well uh, is a seller of seeds and native plants too. Lastly, here's just some resources on native bees. So where you can learn more about bees of New England. Um, the Vermont Wild Bee Survey has a great user-friendly guide. Wild Bees of New York has these amazing pictures and species profiles. If you're more scientifically inclined, Specialist Bees of the Eastern US is a full list of all of our specialist bees um, with their host plants and their distribution, if you want to go out hunting for some of them. Um, but be aware that only scientific names are used on that website. Unfortunately, most of our bees don't have common names. Um, the last one I will mention here is the Bee City USA program. It's hosted by the Xerxes Society, and it's an initiative um, where you as a town, um, or it has, they have one for campuses as well, um, can be certified by this program, and it's a pledge to increase pollinator habitat and reduce pesticide use on a, a town or citywide scale. So um, that's a really great way to get people together to improve their community. So thank you everybody for having me here tonight. Um, it was a pleasure to talk to you all. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And if you're interested about learning more about what I do um, at ESF um, and the work going on at the Restoration Science Center, please check out our website below. Um, we have a lot of information there about converting your lawn into a native meadow, if you're into that sort of thing, um, and, and much more. So at this point, I'm happy to take any questions you have and thank you for watching. Thank you so much, Molly. That was a phenomenal presentation. Um, I was sitting here just kind of captivated by it and, 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 and wanting it to warm up outside so I can go chase bees. <laughs> um, I know winter's a hard time for entomologists. Yeah. Uh, Nelson, uh, that uh, specialist bee website that Molly mentioned was the one that I was thinking of. So you might want to make a note of that URL. Um, if, if you have a uh, questions about some of these resources, feel free to email me. Um, I will put my email into the chat and uh, you can- You're welcome to email me too. Yeah, um, use, use my me email a... was up there. I can type my email again if it's, if it's helpful, but I'm always happy to answer any questions that if I can't answer them here right now um, or provide any resources. Yeah, I'll put that in the chat. Uh, the Atlas of Life will be uh, doing a little bit of uh, volunteer-based bee monitoring, uh, particularly on agricultural lands where I've, I've become very interested in uh, the potential for pollinator conservation. Um, I also, the, Molly showed you the uh, Martha's Vineyard Atlas of Life project in iNaturalist. I spend a lot of time um, trying to identify things there, and I can certainly respond to uh, any kinds of requests for uh, uh, identification help or pointers on where and how to look for things. Don't hesitate to pester me with that sort of thing. It's actually the part of the job that I like the most. I'm also on okay. that on INET as well. So if you post a, a pollinator of any kind in New England or New York, I will probably be reviewing it as well. Yep. So I'm on there too. Um, we're not seeing too many questions here. I guess we can probably bring things to an end. It has been a very informative presentation. Uh, I was really grateful to Molly. Uh, was really grateful to all of you uh, participants for sharing uh, a little bit of uh, your time with us this evening. I hope it leaves you uh, burning with curiosity about <laughs> bees. They're really fantastic little creatures. And uh, I see a question on here um, from back a ways. Um, someone asked about um, tick spraying and if permethrin has any 
impact on bees or other pollinators. Oh That's, yeah, question from Luann Johnson. Why don't you handle that one, Molly? Oh, a great question um, that I don't know the answer to. Um, so yeah, I know I know stuff about the impacts of mosquito spraying for sure. Um, tick spraying in general, I know a little bit less about. The, the concerns with a lot of these you know, generalized broadcast sprayings is that um, generally insecticides, you know, you, you spray it for mosquitoes, um, but it's it's killing everything else too. So, um, you know, when it comes to things like mosquito spraying, they recommend larvicides, which are targeted and they don't have the same sort of widespread fatality of insects. Um, I, Permethrin is something I'd have to research a little more because it's something I use. Um, it's probably right now one of the best things on the market um, for personal safety. Um, I don't think, I don't want to say anything that I can't back up right now. I know that at least when I work with insects, um, that I wear Promethrin all the time and I've not noticed, you know, uh, deleterious effects, um, but I've not, I'm not familiar with spraying that on a, on a large scale. Um, so that's something I'd have to research a little bit more, but um, I know that's definitely a concern for a lot of people. Um, it's it's one of the things we have to deal with when we tell people, don't look, mow your lawn as much, leave all the leaf litter around. And yes, that's tick habitat too. So um, that's something that, you know, we need, we need to um, research a little bit more for sure. Uh, I see I'll, the I'll question. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> the, the question has come up about how to keep carpenter bees from drilling into houses. Uh, there is probably no uh, totally foolproof solution. One thing I will mention is that they generally don't burrow into wood that has been painted or even heavily stained. It's mostly just bare wood. So making sure that all of the wood surfaces are treated. Uh, is probably your best defense. I'll also mention that there is a wonderful little bee fly. Uh, it's actually a fly called Xenox tigrinus, uh, the tiger bee fly, that is a nest parasite, nest parasite on uh, large carpenter bees. So it actually uh, lays its eggs in those tunnels and the bee uh, larvae are eaten by the fly larvae. Uh, so we have an ally out there. Um, yeah, um, it's a it's a difficult problem. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I know that you know in general, um, you know, carpenter bees. Same thing with carpenter ants are going to prefer to nest in decaying or soft, old, wet wood. You know, things that are already structurally unsound. So um, they're going to go for that first. If you're living in house with wood that probably needs to be replaced already, that's what they're going to go for. Um, if there's other nesting sites that are available, natural nesting sites, so they prefer standing dead dead trees like snags or logs, um, that's going to be their first choice. Um, so as it comes down to the same thing with a lot of um, insect pests um, or other species that we find in great abundances in suburban yards and things, um, a lot of it is just creating enough natural habitat to support their predators and parasites, and that will help those populations balance out. Um, so providing natural nesting sites, perhaps there are ways to paint or treat that wood and replace any wood that's getting too old and falling apart would, will help with that problem. Alrighty, well, thanks again, Molly, and thanks to all of you. Uh, the recording, uh, to answer a couple of questions that have popped up, uh, we did record the webinar and it will be ending up on uh, a website at some point. And in the meantime, um, feel free to hit Molly or me up for any of the information that uh, that you may have missed in, yeah. in watching this. I see that John um, posted in the chat um, something about a study for Promethrin. So thank you for that. I will look into that and read that. Um, and that any new information will help me um, because yeah, that's something I use all the time. So um, thank you for that. I'll, I'll certainly look into that. Great. Right, gonna shut things down here. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you.